Bob, one theme that runs through your work is that people tend to make mistakes. And they seem to make mistakes over and over again. Uh, now, that's quite different than what I learned when I took economics in college, that mm -hmm. people were rational. How did you get to this thought? How did you get to the point of thinking about people's mistakes where they're not necessarily rational? Well, I think when you went to college, the economics profession had reached an unnatural state. <laughs> they, uh, e academics are a bit faddish, like everyone else. And <clears throat> the efficient markets hypothesis was elevated. Mathematical models of rational behavior became the, the rage. And uh, it was just an abnormal time. So I, I think that I was reading more widely and uh, wanting to come back to reality. Was there something you saw in reality that you knew that economic models couldn't explain that led you to this? Well, <laughs> bubbles. <laughs> that was the, I just didn't believe that the story about bubbles was that the markets appear random, but that's only because new information is always unpredictable. They respond only to new information. And I was wondering, well, new information about what? Uh, but uh, they, they seem to, it seemed to be almost like a mythology to me. No, it's, the suggestion was that it's new information about fundamentally important real things. And I just didn't believe it. Uh, the idea that people are so optimizing, uh, so calculating, and so ready to update their information. You know, that's true of maybe a tiny fraction of 1% of people, but this is not, it's not going to explain the whole market. So the story you told about the housing market in advance, famously, was that we were in a bubble, that you were one of the people, perhaps one of the most prominent people to identify this. But, um, you know, one prediction doesn't make a, a track record. Yeah, I know. Do you, do you think it's possible for in stock markets and housing bubbles to know in advance that this is a bubble? Or is it kind of a gut and well, sometimes you're yeah. right and sometimes you're wrong? Well, you will be wrong sometimes, certainly. There might be a story, <laughs> a, a, a real reason that that, uh, that would be the efficient markets theory, that right. it appears mysterious. But that's mysterious only because it's not concrete yet, right. and the people are sensing something. And uh, uh, so there is some truth. The efficient markets hypothesis is not totally wrong. It, it, in fact, something that I teach, and I think it's an important insight. It's just that it's been carried too far. I Don't remember um, in the late 90s, when the stock market was looking a little frothy, you went down to the Federal Reserve and made right. a presentation, and I remember that your wife wrote a Christmas letter in which you, <laughs> right. she said that you expressed concern that you were the one that planted the idea of irrational exuberance in Alan Greenspan's head and contributed to his use of that phrase, right. and then the market tanked. So yeah. is that a true story? What you said is absolutely right. Greenspan said the words irrational exuberance in a speech. evening speech in Washington. And the Tokyo market immediately, which was still open at that time, immediately crashed. And then it spread, well, by you know, 4% or something yeah. like that. And it spread over the whole world as the markets opened. And uh, that's why the word irrational exuberance is famous. Greenspan didn't coin it. I didn't coin it. Green, it was an old phrase. But he just happened to use that phrase, and the market immediately crashed. And did you really feel responsible? Well, I, uh, well, I came home and told my wife, I might have started a worldwide <laughs> stock market crash. I just said it it's sort of jokingly, but I half believed it. And she said, your ego is getting way out of control. But then when, well, I, actually, there was an article about me on the front page of the Wall Street Journal a couple days later about just the same issue. They didn't say whether I did or didn't. <laughs> and my wife said, OK, I apologize. <laughs> but see, the thing is, the markets are that crazy. Right. It's, the power isn't in me. It's in Alan Greenspan. Right. But I had his ear. I, I, I spoke before the uh, board, board, and then I had lunch with him, right. and I, I was talking. So it's possible. Hmm. Uh, and, but this, this is a, a method of thinking about the economy that's very different. It, it makes the economy as unstable and affected by people, individual people. Do you think that bubbles are always a bad thing, or do you think they have some good effects? Well, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's a free world, and people can do what they want. Uh, so I'm not a 
you know, I'm not proposing that we put the straitjacket on these things. The other thing about it is that human nature uh, does, needs stimulation, and uh, people have to have some sense of opportunity and excitement. It, it motivates them to action. I think profits are an important motivator. So in the long run, it's hard to say that bubbles are, are really bad. They take the internet bubble of the 1990s. What that did is it generated a lot of startups, some of them foolish, uh, some of them failed, but others survived. So is it a bad thing? I, I, I find it hard to think what would the alternative be. Right. We could have had a Fed that tried to lean against, the, I'm talking about the 1990s, right. against right. the stock market bubble, or in the early 2000s against the real estate bubble. And I think that would be a good thing. The problem is we don't have any, it, it, ultimately our policies in economics are somewhat intuitive and their models are not accurate enough to tell us what the right policy is. So I'm thinking that probably we'd been better off if we had tamed these bubbles, but there's no way to be sure. And we certainly don't want to do draconian things that would upset the whole system to prevent right. bubbles. Right. 